just talking musicals, musicals with you. Hello, I'm Leslie Ann Knight and welcome to Just Talking Musicals and to the final part of our behind the scenes peek at the Cole Porter musical, Anything Goes. In the last episode, we looked at how Anything Goes miraculously came together at the last minute to be hailed a triumphant success by audiences and critics alike when it opened at the Alvin Theatre on Broadway in 1934. In time, it would go on to become the fourth most successful musical of the whole of the 1930s and so it's hardly surprising to learn that in 1936, it also attracted the attention of the movie moguls at Paramount Pictures in Hollywood. Over the next 20 years, Paramount would go on to produce two films, I might add rather loosely based on the original story, with the first starring Ethel Merman in the lead role and co-starring Bing Crosby, not only known for his popular crooning singing style, but also one of Hollywood's most successful and surefire box office attractions throughout his long career. Co-starring alongside Bing Crosby in the second film in 1956 was the wonderful Donald O'Connor, otherwise known as Gene Kelly's sidekick, Cosmo in Singing in the Rain, and Mitzi Gaynor, most famously known for her role as ensign Nellie Forbush in South Pacific two years later. But thanks to Paramount Pictures, the original storyline to Anything Goes seems just a distant memory. It appears instead that they simply made a musical film with a flimsy story to showcase the talents of its leading stars and called it Anything Goes, which pretty much sums the whole film up. In truth, Anything Goes has been much better served by its stage revivals down through the years. In 1987, the award-winning writer John Wideman teamed up with Russell Crowe's son Timothy to update the original book, reorder the musical numbers and, in true Cole Porter style, they introduced songs from other Porter shows. And they hit the jackpot, opening at the Vivian Beaumont Theatre in Lincoln Centre on October the 19th, 1987. The show ran for a magnificent 787 performances, starring Patti LuPone, Howard McGillan, Bill McCutcheon and Anthony Heald, winning three Tony Awards and a Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Revival of a Musical and Outstanding Actress Award for Miss LuPone, quite right and seeing the show in New York. A rather well-known leading lady of the West End, Elaine Page, was inspired to such a degree that following what must have been a few encouraging phone calls meant that the revival came to London's West End in 1989, complete with Jerry Zachs, who, who had directed the award-winning production on Broadway. Co-starring alongside Elaine Page were Howard McGillan and John Barrowman and the great English comic actor Bernard Cribbins playing Moonface Martin. It was then followed by another highly acclaimed National Theatre revival in 2002. This time it was directed by none other than Trevor Nunn and starred John Barrowman again as Billy, along with the fabulous Sally Ann Triplett as Reno, prompting the esteemed theatre critic Charles Spencer to report of its first night. Think no man happy until he is in his grave, the ancient Greeks repeatedly warned. But then they, poor chaps, hadn't got tickets to Cole Porter's Anything Goes. If a more effective formula for non-pharmaceutical euphoria exists than Trevor Nunn's blissful production of this great musical, I would be hugely obliged if you would get in touch pronto. But I can't believe that anything could lift you more certainly or more joyously to cloud nine than this. Meanwhile, back in New York in 2011, Kathleen Marshall and the Roundabout Theatre Company fanned the flames of yet another glorious revival, opening at the Stephen Sondheim Theatre at 124 West 43rd Street on April the 7th, where it simply dazzled Broadway for an entire year. Directed and choreographed by Kathleen Marshall, starring Sutton Foster as Reno and Colin Donnell as Billy, it received nine Tony and ten Drama Disc Award nominations, with wins for Best Revival and Best Choreography, with the much lauded Sutton Foster deservedly winning both the coveted Drama Desk and Tony Awards for Best Actress in a Musical. In August 1938, Russell Krauss wrote in an article for Stage Magazine, I'm not a musician. I wouldn't know an arpeggio if Walter Damrosch threw one at me and told me he was throwing it. All I know is that some of Cole Porter's music gives me a glow of satisfaction that makes me feel as if I had just dined on sunbeams with chocolate sauce 
and the rest of it thrills me so that my spine tingles. To me, the greatest of the Porter words is fabulous. He uses it frequently and always perfectly. When Miss Merman sang in the verse of I get a kick out of you, I suddenly turn and see your fabulous face. No other word would have been right. No other word is right for Mr. Porter either. His songs are just that. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Cole Porter had always lived with the life of the privileged few, coming from a wealthy family whose fortune was amassed out west by his grandfather, J.O. Cole, whose canny career and pursuit of financial success developed from running a well-located retail store, catering to the hordes of hopefuls panning in for a fortune in the gold rush. And then he went on to wise investments in farmland and the timber industry, and it made him into a very wealthy man. In 1937, just three years after Anything Goes opened at the Alvin Theatre, Cole Porter was seriously injured in a riding accident when his horse shied and fell on top of him, crushing both his legs. Over the next two decades, he underwent countless operations in an attempt to save his legs and alleviate his endless discomfort. But the accident left him in almost constant pain for the rest of his life, although it appears to have had little effect on his creativity leading him to write more musical scores in the years after his accident and before, writing the music and lyrics for more than 50 musicals and films during the course of his life, with his score for Anything Goes being described as one of the finest in American musical history. Anything Goes first appeared from out of the gloom of one of history's worst economic crises, the Wall Street crash and the subsequent Great Depression. It audaciously presented a picture of the high life, luxury and elegance to an audience who had known nothing but economic stress and disaster all around them. But it wasn't to show people what they didn't have, rather to lift them out of the time that they were in and to elevate them to a world that would come again and it worked on its audiences like an uplifting tonic. In the words of the highly esteemed critic and writer Walter Clemens, the complexity of Porter's works sets him somewhat apart from the other great songwriters of the first half of this century, Kern, Berlin, Gershwin and Rogers. A Porter song is a luxury item, expensively made and extravagantly rhymed. In a way no other songs of the period quite did, Porter created a world. It was a between the wars realm of drop dead chic and careless name dropping insouciance, and it was very sexy to be invited. Right, that's it for today. In the next two episodes, we'll be shining the spotlight on the background story to a couple of beautiful songs written by Jerome Kern, and I'll be dusting off one of my best frocks to sing them for you. I'm Leslie Ann Knight. Behind the camera is the wonder that is this show's producer and director, Katie Renaud. You can find Just Talking Musicals on Facebook, and we're lurking on Twitter as well under the name of at Knight and Redout. Oh, and don't forget to click the subscribe button for each new episode alert so you can bag the best front row seats for each new show. See you here again very soon for another instalment of Just Talking Musicals. Just Talking Musicals, Musicals with you. I've, no. <laughs> I can't look at you. Thank you.